Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Late Night Leos with Mike Matson of Mike's Fat Frogs. This is your host, Jeremy, and I have Jeff Scott as co-host. Jeff, you want to say hi? Well, hello, everybody. Hi, Jeff. Um, this show is brought to you by our generous sponsors, Luxurious Leopards, Lilith's Leo Lovables, The Reptile Report Marketplace, Holly's Homebred Reptiles, Happy Gecko Sticky Situation, Top Notch Leopard Geckos, Fire and Ice Leopard Geckos. Thank you all for, for contributing to this wonderful show. Now, Mike, we have on the phone of Mike's Fat Frog. We're going to go over some frogs with him, Pixies and Pac-Mans and stuff like that. Jeff and I both have uh, Pac-Man frogs. Uh, Jeff, in particular, has one from Mike. So let's get Mike on here. Mike, how are you doing tonight? Good. How about you guys? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you, sir. Can't wait to talk some frogs. Perfect. Thank you for having me on the show. No, well, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. That way we can get some uh, some real information from the source. Yeah, not a problem. So, Mike, um, let's start with with husbandry. So, say we're we got a frog. How do you keep a frog? Uh, it depends you on what size. You know, uh, tell me how you got into frogs. Oh well, let's see. About. Uh, Six years ago, I had a brother of mine who needed a hobby, and uh, I used to do snakes at the time, retics and stuff like that, and uh, I ended up buying six Pac-Man frogs from uh, one of the host sellers that I bought from, and gave them to my brother, tried to keep him busy with them, and after a couple months, his interest kind of faded for some reason, you know, um, got into summertime, he wanted to go do other stuff, and I ended up taking him back, and... Uh, I went down to a pet store, and, you know, they're still, the babies I got back were about half dollar size, and I never really kind of paid too much attention to them. I was always more into the snakes. Uh, well, one day I went down to one of the pet stores uh, to buy crickets for the frogs, and I saw a Pac-Man, and then it was about the size of a softball. I thought, oh, that's pretty neat. You know, I fed it a mouse in there, and, and I ended up buying that frog and took it home. Well, I started reading about them a little bit more, trying to figure out, you know, uh, the breeding process on them and all that stuff and the husbandry and I'm more, you know, interested in them every day. And then I saw, you know, new colors kind of showing up here and there on them. And I thought, you know what, this would, this would be something good to kind of get into. It's, you know, not an overpopulated market, but it's something that I think I could do. Um, and I just kind of went from there and started growing. I found, uh, my first blue Pac-Man frog female about five years ago. I actually took a loan out to buy her, um, and she was the first frog that ever produced for me. Huh. That's, that's where, pretty cool. Wow. Where are you I'm located, Mike? I'm in Southern California. I'm uh, in Victorville now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Victorville. I know... I know a Southern California group down there in Orange County. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I seen some of your posts were from La Habra. Oh yeah, I drive I, everywhere. <laughs> Guadalajara, we called it. Yeah, yeah, I drive across the freeways all the time. A lot of a lot of the people who I buy tanks from and you know various supplies and stuff like that, I drive all the way down the hill and across to basically L.A. and back. So yeah. they'll see posts for me everywhere in between Southern California. So is the high desert a good place to, to breed those? Yeah, it's actually pretty good. Um, the main reason I'm up here is for uh, warehouse spacing. Um, you can get, uh, you know, 1,500 square foot warehouse reasonably cheap considering what it is, you know, 30 miles away. It's two to three times the price. Yeah, it, it must take a lot of space to do those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um for uh, one spawn of tadpoles, I use about a thousand gallons worth of tanks. Wow! My oh, gosh, that's a, a lot. A lot of space. <laughs> a lot, a lot of space. Wow. So is this all you do then, Mike? Is yeah. You just breed Pac-Man frogs and stuff like that. You don't have um, as we call it, daytime or or a big boy job. Um, I used to. I used to do a few things. Uh, family, which is you see uh, me posting around Blaina Park and all that. I used to drive semi trucks and deliver heavy equipment like backhoes and um, stuff like that. I also used to operate those, but 
it's a 150 miles a day round trip for me to go to do that job. So I just kind of worked on it to figure a way out where the frogs can be my primary source of income and tr- try and keep around that. Oh, that's cool. Well, that's I guess a dream it's working job. for you. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, how, how long have you been in business for yourself? Um, for two years, I've been breeding the frogs mainly full time. I work here and there um, for family whenever they need help. You know, they just give me a call. Hey, you know we're overloaded. Can you come and do something? Sure. You know I give them a hand. Um, but about about two years or so. Wow, that's that's cool. That is cool. I know. Oh. Go ahead. That's it. Oh, I, I, I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm chomping at the bit here because I, you know, I'm new to these Pac-Man frogs, and I seem to be particularly having a hard time with mine. Um, the husbandry, like I was saying before, how, you know, once say we're looking for a frog, what kind of frog should we be looking for? Is there a particular species or a particular color or size or anything like that that we should be looking for when we're looking for a frog? As far as if if you're looking for a Pac-Man frog for your first pet, something safe, um, if you're a first-timer, something safe would be a frog about half dollar size would be a would be a good choice. They've already, you know, well-established. They're usually about a three- to four-month-old frog at that size. Um, and they're, they're a little more forgiving. If you forget to mist them or... You know, fill the water dish. They they kind of have that ability to burrow down a little bit, find the moisture. Whereas the babies, they just don't have that experience. Um, they uh, the babies can also be touchy getting to feed and stuff like that. Especially if you get them really young, where they're just you know a couple days out of the water sometimes. Um, but as far as the tank. You can do it as simple as, you know, a 5- to 10-gallon tank. You can do paper towel bottom that's slightly misted, uh, moss in a corner, and a water dish. Or you can make it as extravagant as you want, you know, f- fake plants and the cocoa fiber and a water dish. As long as they're between 76 to 82 degrees, is you're pretty much golden. Uh, that's Yeah, that's about what my um, leopard gecko room stays Mm. So, so if um, say in particularly, I'm having a hard time getting mine to feed. Even still, I have to I have to pull him out, and I, I try and feed him every night. But I don't want to stress him out every night either, because I know handling mm-hmm. them um, stresses him out, and I don't want to do that since he's so new. Um, what what do you think could be going on, or what could I be doing wrong? What what size is he? How big? Mm, probably between quarter and half dollar size. Quarter and a half dollar. Usually, usually at that size, they want to eat one thing. They're not so much on a varied diet at that size. Between quarter and half dollars, they're used to crickets. Um, you can do earthworm pieces, and sometimes the scent of that will get them to, you know, actually bite and take something new. Uh, waxworms are okay to tongue feed. Um, let's see. Dubia roaches they have a little bit harder time with just because the exoskeleton of the dubia. Some for some reason the frogs don't like it too much crunching down on it. They're more of a soft food eater. Um, hmm. Let's see what else would they be okay eating. You can also what? try. There's a, a few powdered diets. There's Zoomed. There's the samurai powdered food, and then Hakari, which I'm actually going to be trying this week. They've already made a pellet diet to where you can just pull it out of the bag and feed it. You don't have to mix it or anything, um, which I'm kind of excited to try that. But as far as what may be wrong, it may just be it just wants a certain food item, and they can be picky gotcha. like so, that for, for a little while. So, so you think crickets, I should just go out and buy a few crickets and see if it'll eat off those? Yes, I would. I would. I'd get okay. a few if it's – I'd get a few, like, mediums and then a few large and just put them in a small area, let the frogs soak, maybe pull them out, put them in a water dish, and let mm-hmm. them soak, and then take uh, like a six-quart Sterilite tub and just put them in there with the crickets and leave them in there for a half hour or so and just see if he goes to eating. Huh. Okay, so so 
also put the – do you tong feed the crickets or you just you let them loose in there with them or what? You can you can tong feed them also. Um, generally, if you soak the frogs, it kind of wakes them up a little bit, gets their appetite, gets them stimulated, and they're they're more likely to eat off the tongs after you pull them and soak them and all of that. Hmm. So – so how long do you think we would have to go on doing something like that before he's eating in his enclosure? Maybe just give him a week or so, about a week to two weeks, and just get him get him going again, get his appetite stimulated. Um, generally, like this time of the year also, they want to just cool and shut down and kind of not go on food and stop eating, um, which even my adults right now are doing the same thing, but they, you know, I'm trying to keep them with that breeding size and everything, so I make sure they eat, um, which we can go into the force feeding, how to do it, the different techniques. It's it's pretty easy, and it's very quick also. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? That, that sounds good. Okay. Um, if you're, if you're going to force feed the frogs, I would give them something that, you know, is high in protein, the nutrients, the vitamins, all of that. Um, especially for the stress. If you you know if you're pulling them out every night, just force feeding the cricket, contributing too much to them. Versus if you pull them out and you know force feed them a ball of like the Pac-Man food where it has everything in that diet, and that just gets them stimulated and they'll grow from it. Um, you can use a couple different tricks. You can use the tongs, the the tweezers on the tongs, the very tip of it, and tap in between the frog's lips basically. And they'll generally open their mouths. And then you just set it in. Um, if you get a frog that doesn't want to open their mouth, you can use like a debit card, a plastic debit card, and just barely like touch on the inside between the lips and they'll open it. And then you just set the food inside. Um, another, you know, couple uh, issues after that that I've, I've ran into multiple times with frogs just wanting to spit out food. I've noticed that after you force feed them, when you set them back down, kind of give them a little nudge. Get them to jump a few times and then close the close the tub, close the tank, whatever you have them in, and just leave them. And that will get them to swallow the food. For some reason, they just, they'll just they swallow it then. But it, they just jump and time, swallow at the same time, huh? Yeah, they'll jump and they'll kind of um, like adjust and for, almost forget that the food's in their mouth. So by the time they're done moving, you know, basically with their flight response of, you know, us basically pushing them, scaring them a little bit, get them to move around, um, they just figure, oh, something's in my mouth, swallow it. And I rarely have frogs spit out food after that. Huh. Yeah, I, I haven't had any problems with it. He, I put some, I don't know, I, I, I set them up with some cocoa fiber a little like a feeder dish with a real shallow water in it, and uh-huh. um, I, I put them in there. And I don't—I think the second day I got them, I put some real small doobie in there, one fill in the water dish, and um, he went right for it a couple of times. Finally got it, and then he used his hands like I was real hungry eating a cheeseburger, <laughs> you know, uh-huh. trying to. I, I thought he was going to eat his hand. <laughs> yeah. He's shoving, Shovel, shoveling food in his mouth with both hands. It's, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, you'll see them sometimes. The adults will get so excited, especially going after mice on tongs or something like that. They'll go up and try and grab it with their hands and pull it in, but miss the mouse and bite their hands. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. It's it's really uh, almost comical. <laughs> yeah. How about how about mealworms or superworms? Are those good for them? Um, you can feed them. Some people say that they'll cause impaction and stuff like that. I've never had an issue with it, um, but it's just, as far as the frogs go, it, it just seems to be one of those stigmas where everybody thinks that that'll happen or they'll get impaction from it. You know, the only time that they actually get impaction is if they're biting at the cocoa and for some reason they can't pass it. Um, but I've, mealworms and superworms are fine also. There's as long yeah. as you make sure that the mealworm isn't alive by the time they swallow, which 99% of the stuff, you know, is already gone by the time they crunch down on it. Oh yeah, no, they're not going to last long in the in the stomach acids and everything anyway. No, yeah. It's... Hey, I don't know, because I, I threw a uh, freshly molted superworm in there, and he, he took that uh, like quick. 
Oh, yeah. And he, he did the old sh- shove the cheeseburger in his mouth thing, too. <laughs> So probably a varied diet of, you know, crickets, dubia, um, would probably be better, huh? Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd keep it varied. That, by the time they're adults, you know, if you have a varied diet as babies, they're a lot easier to feed as adults because adults will want to stop eating for about two to three months a year. And uh-huh. if, it seems to be the ones that have, if you just feed them mice or if you just feed them crickets um, or, you know, earthworms, they'll all stop. But if they have a varied diet, usually something will kind of, you know, perk them up a little bit and uh, they'll just bite at it and eat. So you can always get them to eat off of a varied diet. Whereas the frog that just wants mice, say you can't get mice for that week. Well, you go and try and feed it earthworms, you know, and it won't want to eat them. So it's always good uh, to just have that, you know, varied those the varied diet. Yeah, that yeah, that's, that sounds that sounds just uh, like uh, oh, leopard geckos are too. <laughs> if you yeah. vary their diet, then they'll you know, no matter where they go, they'll eat something. Yeah. So, I I seen you, uh, people posting earthworms and um, night crawlers. It's not good to feed them too much, and then. I don't know. There seems to be a little controversy on that too. I, I haven't done that yet, but I, I can get those. <laughs> yeah, there's. It, it depends on location. You know where you get your stuff. If you if you're pulling out your night crawlers from you know outside in your lawn at night when they come up and get moisture from the grass and the sprinklers, um, that's usually not a good idea. They're yeah, no, I... thing in the soil that you know you you have other frogs that may pass through your yard at night and you don't know it. Um, the the night crawlers can carry various parasites. Um, if if you go to the stores, uh, they're okay generally, um, but you're you're not going to avoid everything. You know, s- certain things happen. You get you'll get worms with, that have parasites in them that'll transfer over to your frogs. You know, every every six months or so. If you have a large number of frogs, if your frog is always skinny and just doesn't seem to be gaining weight, you know, give it a little bit of dewormer and treat it for 10 days and then usually see if he picks back up and weight and stuff like that. Um, huh, what, what are you using for uh, dewormer, Panicure? Or? You can use Panicure, Safeguard. Those are pretty easy. And uh, there's a few different ways you can actually give it to them. If you have problems, you know, holding your frog, trying to open his mouth, do all that, put the crickets in a bag and do a little bit extra, you know, like a pea-sized ball of the Panicure or Safeguard, put it inside the plastic bag and shake your crickets up in it. And so that Uh that dewormer gets on the actual cricket, your frogs eat the cricket, you know, and over the group of crickets, there should be enough to actually start treating the frog. Huh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, do you think... Do you, do you think the crickets give them? They get parasites from the crickets too, because that's the big uh, stigma in uh, feeding crickets to leopard geckos, or is um, they can carry I've, parasites. I've heard of it, um, but you know, unless you grow the stuff yourself and are constantly testing the crickets, you never know. You never yeah. really know. You know what what they get a hold of. I mean, I'm I'm by one of the one of the larger cricket farms here, and I mean they do a pretty good job on keeping their stuff clean. I mean. Their workers are there every day cleaning tubs out. It just depends where you get your, you know, your food items, your food sources, wherever they come from. It's 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 hard to say, you know, the the crickets in the stores are good or bad. It just you may get that one time where stuff goes bad on you. Yeah, and, and then the earthworms or something. With the earthworms, do you just go to like say Walmart or to your local sporting goods store and get your earthworms there, or or your yeah. nightcrawlers? Yeah, Walmart. I haven't had problems with the WalMarts. You know, here and there, I'll go and grab you know nightcrawlers and feed something that doesn't want to eat rodents or you know something like that. I'll go and grab a you know cup of twenty five of them, and and I've never had problems with them. But I constantly you know treat the frogs like twice a year, so. Usually, I don't have any issues with them. Or you wind up getting your panic here and stuff. Do what now? Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, um, what are you treating for? Pinworm or is? Yeah, I I know some some of them are type specific. uh, You know, for uh, as far as uh, dewormers and stuff. 
Yeah, there's pinworms, there's lungworms are the ma- the main two. Um, but you'll always see them too. I mean, when you treat the frogs, there's another way, which is the powder diet, which you'll put the dewormer in that and you'll stir it up and it'll create a ball with that dewormer in there. But I've never seen worms come out of the frogs after deworming. Oh, they just kind of digest them. Huh? Yeah, they're uh, something I've never seen them come out in the feces. So either I haven't had a problem of it, or have been fortunate enough to miss that issue. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Hmm. And where do you where do you wind up getting your your dewormer from? Uh, you can get them from feed stores. Uh, I have a wholesaler here in Southern California that I supply that he keeps it on stock. So whenever I run out of it, I just go and buy it from him. But generally feed stores, you can get it. Uh, your local vets, they usually have no problems, you know, giving you it without having to go in and have the frog checked out and all that stuff. Yeah, panic is a pretty mild one too. Yeah. And they're generally pretty safe. It's real hard to overdose on panic here in the safeguard dewormers. Yeah. Nice. No, I, I don't know. I, I just know I enjoy this um, little little Pac-Man frog. I've been doing leopard geckos for so long. It's it's cool to have something else in the in the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I had to do recently. I went out and got a few different species and going to try giving those a shot at breeding. Yeah, I I seen you got some. Uh, I don't know. I, you posted on the Pac Man Frogs USA or whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, Samurai Green, and I'm, I'm trying to take in all these different morphs. Oh yeah. And yeah. Like, I, I, I don't want to start breeding them, but <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, they're, they're fun. They're, they're fun. Everyone right, should right. attempt it at least once. Yeah, I limited room. <laughs> yeah, I'll say a hundred. Uh, how how many gallons of of water do you uh, say that they need to be, after you breed them? I use about a thousand gallons worth of water, space wise, to raise one spawn, and that's constant changing that water every three days. Also, and that's that's just from one pairing, right? From a one male and pairing, a female. one one female. And they they lay what two hundred, three hundred eggs at a time or something? No, I had. Um, they say they lay up to two thousand eggs. Holy but I had holy. the last the last <laughs> two big spawns, uh one in September and one in August. The September one, I had eighteen hundred and sixty five Pac Man babies come out of water. From one female. Man. From oh one my God. <laughs> so I think uh, you're supposed to lose about forty percent of the tadpoles. Just because they, there's a reason why they have so many in the wild, you know, they're uh, they get eaten quite often. So they, you have two thousand, you hope to have one percent, you know, end up with ten to a hundred babies that actually grow up to be adults. Um, versus, you know, say your ball pythons, they have you know six to twelve babies a year because they have a high chance of actually growing up. Um, where the frogs, that's why they have larger, you know, spawns, but. I think the number 2,000 is kind of a limited number. It just depends on the female. Yeah. No, I know the yeah. local rivers up here, oh, the Feather River, you go there a certain mm-hmm. time of year, and, um, I mean, there's the, the string-type eggs, and then there's the eggs they attach to rocks, and it's just like a... Uh, certain little spots you jump in there, and it's just like a gelatinous mass of frog eggs, and it's. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, all the toads. The toads will do the string. Hmm. The different strings, and they lay a lot of eggs. They lay up to seven thousand eggs. Some of the species. Oh my god. Yeah. So, so so it it so the Pac-Man is a frog. It's not a toad, right? Yes, it is a frog. Okay. And they. So they do frogs have tadpoles and toads have pollywogs, or is that just it's it's the same, same they thing. they do the same same process you know they lay the egg they hatch the tadpoles and depending on the species it could they could come out of the water at fourteen days or they can come out of the water at fifty days it just really depends on the species yeah and, and the, but they all go through the same metamorphosis process yeah 
No, I think because I was, and I, I don't know, I read somewhere they drowned real easy, and I go, well, maybe it's a toad, not a frog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, some, um, some aren't the best know. swimmers. Yeah. So we just we, we just use the little tiny feeder dish with, I don't know, about half full of water. And yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll go sit in that, and then... um. He'll eat, and then he'll sit in the corner. I just have him in a uh, big fish bowl right now. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that um, works. Yeah, it, he seems, you know, it's, they they feel safe and like the corner, you know. I, I, They'll find their one spot and not move. Yeah, he likes he likes one corner, and then if the water dish dries up, he burrows down. Yeah. <laughs> So I see mine's all over the mine's all over its enclosure all the time. I it's he, he I see him on top, I see him in the water dish, I see him under the leaves. Um and then he's sometimes they, all I see is his eyeballs in the dirt. He, I mean he is all over his enclosure. I don't know if that's very a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, he's very active. He may be he may be hunting looking for crickets if he's if he's uh constantly moving around, you're seeing him different hours in different locations. He may be trying to hunt for food. Interesting. Okay, so uh, I'm failing my my poor Pac-Man frog is what you're telling me. Uh, well, not quite. As long as he's still up and kicking, he's doing all right. <laughs> yeah, all right. he's not in the freezer, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I, I even bought some crickets and put them in there, and he, he, um, he just sits in a corner and waits for him to come to him, and then <laughs> he gets them. <laughs> you got he, one of the fat frogs. Yeah. It's it's I forget what it was strawberry something or rather. <laughs> what what color is he? Um, like he's albino strawberry. Like the uh, sun kissed strawberry one? pineapple. Yeah, yeah, strawberry pineapple sun kissed. I think that's what it was called. I should have wrote it down. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's the same yeah, thing you got. You got right, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. I think mine's. The, I, I thought, uh, yeah, uh, that, and that was the they next thing. The I, I have, yeah, they look very similar. I know because I saw one that was really red. I saw some that were more green with light hues of red, and I saw some that were just all green or yellowish mm-hmm. color, even. So I don't, I don't know which one's which. I, I had no idea. I thought they were just uh, okay. That's just a color morph, and that's just what it is. I didn't know there was actual names to it. You know, and the guy oh, yeah. asked um, when I bought them, I was like, hey, so what is? Um, you know what's what's the deal with this with the strawberry the strawberry pineapple and all this stuff and he he laughed you know he laughed at me I was like, what you know what, what okay what's going on and he says well that's just a gimmick to to sell frogs it's um it's um not an actual like morph or whatever it's just it's just a way to sell a frog it's they're all albinos that's all he said hmm. so I was thinking oh okay well that's that's interesting that. That's just kind of a gimmicky way to sell a frog or whatever, you know. And it was kind of odd that he laughed about it. You know, it kind yeah. of put me off a little bit. I mean, I really liked what he had, but and he was willing to talk to me. But that, you know, that fact that that's why I was I wanted to get you on and see what you had to say about, you know, the different color variations, the morphs, and all that Trade fun stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There's um, there's probably. 15 different types of albinos and the combinations. It just depends, you know, what you look at. If you want to break it down as far as, um, for instance, like the ball python, you know, you take a a normal and you take uh, like a mystic and stuff like that that looks to the average person like a normal ball python. But to the breeders, Mm -hmm. there's different little indications that show that, hey, this is actually a different morph than this one here. If you look at the inside pattern on the frog, and the outside pattern on the frog. Um, strawberry pineapples, strawberries, uh, a lot of uh, – the the first albinos originated with Kim Thomas at Frog Ranch. And he's come up with – you know, over the years he's released different colors, and they're very beautiful frogs. The strawberries are more of a red on the color spectrum. Um, the strawberry pineapples, they'll have a red pattern, but they have more of a yellow in the body. And you don't really see it that much as babies. You don't see the difference until they actually grow up to adults. You put a strawberry next to a strawberry pineapple, you'll see the color difference. You put a a lime green albino Pac-Man frog next to a regular albino Pac-Man frog as an adult, 
you'll see the difference. Uh, just the babies, they're so small that you can't see the set, you know, the little subtle uh, changes in the different colors on them. Yeah, I'm sure the color kind of spreads out as they grow, right? Yes, yes. And certain yeah. certain lines stay very bright as adults. Uh, certain colors do a huge change. Um, for example, there's the samurai blue Pac-Man frogs. There's, I've noticed, I've had the samurai blue Pac-Mans for about six to seven years, and my oldest female is nine years old. But she, when I bought her, she was supposed to be a blue. I figured, okay, blue, you know, they'd come in, they be an actual blue color. The first strains of the Samurai Blues were actually a green color as adults. Over the last few years, we've been selective breeding, you know, certain adults back together to get a stronger presence of a blue as an adult. And now I have adults that are actually blue as the sky. Um, but they also, I've noticed... I've also noticed the color changes. They kind of act like uh, crested geckos and certain species of chameleons where the colors will be real bright one day and they'll kind of fade and go dull the next. So you'll get a, a blue Pac-Man one day that goes to almost a uh, green color the next. Oh, depending oh, on almost, the like, almost like firing up type of thing and firing yes. down as they call it? Yes. Yeah, the same thing. Um, which, you know, is... It's it's kind of hard to explain to someone that that's never seen that before, or hasn't you know spent the time around. Say, hey, this is what it looks like on you know certain days, and here's what it is on others. That's why I take pictures. Uh, I'll post it here and there just to kind of educate everybody of, you know, here's a samurai blue, and then two hours later this is the same frog, and I go really? It's it's almost like a ninety percent change in color. Wow. Mm. That's that's. That's pretty cool. I mean, I, I didn't realize that they actually did that, too. Would it be diet, habitat, you know, temperature? Can you guys hear me okay? You cut out there for a second. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Could it, would it be diet or um, habitat, temperature, something like that, that makes them uh, fire up or being yeah, around another frog? <laughs> I think it may be uh, almost a mood setting. Um, generally, when they're relaxed, I, I, as what I would think, they'd be relaxed. They're not stressed. They're just sitting, um, buried. You know, they, they're regular feeding. They seem to have that real nice bright color. When they stress, just like, you know, chameleon species, when they're stressed out, they'll be a brown or a, just a drab green color. Um, the same thing with the at least the blue Pac-Man frogs. They'll kind of color change. And uh, it, it, it's not a diet thing because they all eat the same thing. It's it's um, there's no food that enhances a frog's color. At least that I've found. Oh, we, we, no food. No, we we can't feed them fish food to enhance the color. Yeah. <laughs> Cur carotene. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a that's another stigma that's out there. Is the the blue Pac-Mans have to eat the samurai food to keep the blue color. That that's not true. It just depends on what strain of blue you get. Same thing okay, with not, you know, not not true with yours, right? Do what now? Not true with yours, at least. Yeah, no. Yours, it's, yours um, holds blue to, to blue, and that blue is blue for you, yeah. and that's not any special food or any special lighting or effects or any yeah, other no, funny stuff. Yeah, nothing weird. It's it just depends on the strain. There's uh. There's samurai blues, there's blue peppermints, there's peppermints, which uh, your peppermints now, I've kind of classified them to where they're the ones that are green, but with uh -huh. a little bit of blue. The blue peppermints tend to have, you know, about a 50-50 blue color. The samurai blue, I don't sell them as the green ones anymore. I classify them under peppermints, where they're, I know they're going to be a green frog when they're adults. They may have a little blue tint as a baby, but I know what color they're going to be, as, especially since I've seen thousands of them now. Um, mm -hmm. I've kind of picked out, you know, which ones will be which, and I've divided them up to three different colors now. So that way, okay, here, you want a blue frog as an adult, you can have one that's like a 50-50, which is your blue peppermint, or now your samurai blue, which is going to be a blue tint when it's adult. Hmm. And and. Okay, so are all these albinos also, or or is there normals that are these colors, or is it just albinos, or is it a combination? Um, you know, how does that work? As far as the albino coloring? Well, no, I mean, just, just like, so 
these the samurai blues are they're a normal they're not albino or anything just so people know what we're talking about because i i know yeah. there's a lot of albinos out there we, and that's what we started off talking about was like the sun kiss the sunburst and the uh pineapples and stuff like that so i, I just want to make sure that everybody knows what we're talking about that these are normals that are blue that the yeah. blue coloring and not albinos yeah they're they're, blue coloring, but i want them to get yeah they're mixed a, up they're a more, yeah sorry about that they're a morph color it's just another it's you know blue green albino orange which is your apricot uh, there's there's a whole color spectrum which is the colors are based off of. Uh, we can go back to the albinos real quick. I can kind of run through a couple of those. Um, your regular, you know, Argentine horn frog, which is your Cranwell's Pac-Man. The albino, the original albino, is more of a, a yellow color. Um, has some pink, some oranges in the mix there. Uh, you can go from that to I believe the next one that came out would be the strawberries, which are a red. As adults, they have kind of like pinstriping almost between the patterns. It's little lines. Um, the the strawberry pineapples, they're red, and then the actual pattern of the body is yellow. So they'll have the red pinstriping with a yellow pattern. Um, yeah. Kim, Kim at Frog Ranch just came out with, uh, I believe it's Sunburst is what he calls them, which they're a red frog that has... Um, a yellow color down the back and yellow color on the side. Then, uh, let's see, there's lime green albinos, which are a yellow with almost like a, a green tint to them. And those, I think, are the prettiest of all the albinos, especially if you get some really, really nice ones. They have that green that you can see through the yellow as an adult. They're gorgeous frogs. Um, then when you start crossing the different colors, there's the apricots, which is similar to the strawberries, but they're more on the orange color side of it. They look real similar as babies, but when you put them together side by side, you can see just the different shade colorations, and they do look super different as adults. They're an orange. Um, they fade out, though, once they grow a little bit. They usually will be like a pale, pale orange color. You have the samurai super apricots, which samurai is a genetic line similar like Bob Clark or Graziani, you know, pastels, the same thing. Um, but they, the super apricots are bright orange as adults, body color and pattern. And then when you start, say you cross the, the super apricots with the lime green albinos, that's what I come out with as the sun kiss, where they're orange body to a pink color with lime green stripes and coloration on the blotches and stuff like that. Um, the citrus is a regular apricot line crossed with a lime green albino, which gives you a lime green body, and the pattern is orange. <laughs> which, they're pretty frogs. There's, there's, it's the same thing. You know, you mix, you know, one color of ball python mixed with another. You create, you know, certain of each original parent colors, and then another, you know, basically super version of it or a co-dominant version. Well, is there like no nos not to mix this strain of albino with that strain of albino, or is there just one strain that everybody's adding color to? Um, there's, it's pretty much one strain. All the the original strain came from Kim's, and they've just been crossed in with wild caught animals and get heads and breed back to each other. There is different <laughs> strains, um, but as far as I've noticed, there's no issue with breeding the different strains back to each other. And you'll still get an, an albino frog out yes. of it? Or you... Yes, yeah. Well, For example, if you take, you know, the original albino strain and cross it with the strawberry, you're going to get your albinos, you're going to get strawberries, and you're going to get a mix between the two colors. It seems where if you, um, for example, if you mix uh, a brown Pac-Man with an albino, you are, you're going to get albino babies because now the brown Pac-Mans that are throughout the pet trade Pretty much all of them have that genetic being albino. Yeah, wow. you have to really line breed these frogs now to get all the different strains out of them. To just get one color morph coming out of the spawn, it's it's very rare that I get one or two colors only out of a spawn, even with the same colored parents. Just because they're so everything's so mixed up now. Huh? Yep, absolutely. I mean, even even with the blue Pac-Man frogs. I'll get the super apricots and I'll get lime green albinos out of two blue frogs. Oh, that's that's cool though, because you never know what you're going to get. 
exactly. like a box of chocolate. <laughs> so, so if they uh, a box of chocolate, if you took one of the, say it was um, one of the apricots out of a blue pairing, and you mm-hmm. took one of those babies and put it back to a blue, could you get blues out of that, or would you get more apricots, or you know how would that work? You'll get both. Um, I did that one year. I didn't hold back very many of my own frogs for the first couple years. So now I'm starting to breed, you know, the different genes back to a certain color to find out. When I bred an apricot that had blue parents back to a blue, I got frogs that were red and blue, the same color on the frog, red and blue mix. And then you do get your blues and you'll get apricots. But the Kodom kind of a... Yeah. Kind of a thing going on. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to explain because there's so many other different little genes that have been thrown into these things. Unless you line breed, you don't know exactly what they're going to do. Um, but you'll get you'll get all sorts of stuff. I have I have a frog that I call a tan that will come out to be a real light golden color to almost have a purple and red hue through it. And they're gorgeous frogs, but they come from blues to a regular Pac-Man, just a brown frog. When you mix a blue to a brown, they create gorgeous frogs. Huh. That sounds interesting. I wish I had more room. <laughs> yeah, I know. I sounds like, man, I need way more room than I got. I, <laughs> yeah. I thought my leopard geckos were pro- prolific. It doesn't sound like it has one, you know, one pairing of Pac-Man. 1,500 babies. Put that oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Out of house and yeah, home. That's, that's, you know, that's, that's the main reason also that the breeding... Tr- the breeding knowledge of the frogs is kind of kept to a secret. We don't really give out how to breed them just because, you know, say you have 2,000 people in the U.S. that breed Pac-Mans, and they produce, you know, say just 2,000 babies each a year. There's 4 million frogs that you're looking at that are on the market from 2,000 people. Yeah. They're, they're so prolific that it's hard to say, you know what, here, you go out and learn how to breed these. You learn how to breed and just kind of give it all out. Um it, you kind of have to protect the frogs almost in a way. Um, there's, there's, it, I, I would love for everybody to try it once or twice and just see if they can do it. You know, it's a, it's an actual, you know, great accomplishment if you can breed frogs. It's, they're very hard to breed. They're not a simple species to breed. Yeah, so they're, not, they're not like a leopard gecko, then, huh? Well, some, some geckos hard. I can't breed leopard geckos to save my life. Really? Oh, gee. I'm bad with hatching eggs. I'm bad with hatching eggs. I can do the frogs just fine, but I'm not the greatest with hatching eggs. Uh, Shoot me a PM, I'll send you a pair. Yeah. I'm I'm actually kind of wanting a big pair of leopard gecko. That that intrigues me that they're up to 11 and 12 inches. Oh, yeah, the giant stuff is, it's it's pretty cool. And it just keeps getting bigger. yeah, we just yeah, keep they, line breeding it, and it keeps getting bigger. Wow. Yeah, they, they line breed the, the big frog. They're the big frogs. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> late night Leos, we're talking about frogs. <laughs> oh, yeah, late night frogs. <laughs> late night frogs tonight. No, they're they're so cool. But, yeah, the um, the giants and super giants are... Um, they they keep uh, basically line breeding, you know, selectively breeding the big, bigger gecko to bigger gecko. Even even the ones without the giant gene, if you breed big gecko to big gecko, you're going to get bigger geckos. Wow. That's 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 why they've grown through the through the years. Huh. I mean, it used to be, yeah, it used to be I don't know forty grams. Yeah, 30, 40, 40 grams. Forty grams to for females to breed, and now it's what fifty. 55? Yeah, 56, they're saying, yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of females that I breed at, I don't know, 60 grams, 63 grams. Wow. Yeah. I had a I had a female this year that I, I bred her. She, it was her, I hatched her here in my first season, and when it was time for her to breed, she was actually 70 grams. Yeah. Well, so, you know, with, well, yeah, within, a, within a year, if you do, like Jeff was saying, the, the big gecko, thing, you know, just because you're looking for, for a, a nice, robust animal, just, just as any breeder, it, it doesn't matter whether you're doing fish yeah. or you're doing frogs or you're doing leopard geckos, you want a, you want a healthy, strong, big animal to reproduce with. And, um, exactly. 
that's uh, it, you know it's crazy how how like Jeff said they they just keep getting bigger and bigger every year. The and you're not going to get a big gecko every single time. Even big gecko to big gecko, you you could get one that maxes out at thirty or forty grams. Yeah, you know it could be three years old and be thirty forty grams. You know and. and not to say that one's not going to be a good breeder. It could be a good, good breeder, but most people are are the bigger is better, you know, type of thing. So uh, the the smaller geckos have gone by the wayside unless it's something you're specifically breeding for. Yeah, color, yeah. different morphs and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Different different forms of albinism, different strains. Yeah. That that aren't compatible. That's why I asked on the the frog. <laughs> yeah. No. So so far they all seem compatible. Um, another another weird genetic thing that I'd like to talk about is the mutants. Uh. Um, do you guys know much about them? The the mutants. Nothing what, they got like a. They're yeah, pretty. the mutant the frog. They're they're what? They're called mutants, um, which is basically a blanket term for each and every one of them is pretty much a new morph. They'll come out of the water, um, say, for phantoms, example, for phantoms. They're silver frog by the time they're adults, but they come out of the water as a blue. And you can't tell for about three to four months until they start losing the blue color and the silver kind of takes over on it. Those are very far and few between. I have the only four in the U.S. that I know of. Um, there's a couple in China. I think there's about 16 of them worldwide. And, uh, another one is, um, you know, your, your color changers. Mutants are basically a color changer frog. They'll come out looking one way. And by the time they're adults, they've changed three or four complete different colors. I've had, um, I've had, I have one male here. That's an adult. He's a translucent, um, with blue eyes, but he started out brown. And change wow. the screen, change like to leucistic or something. Yeah, com- completely leucistic. Just changed to a pink color. And as an adult, he held the clear belly, which you can see his heart beating. It's so clear, his skin's so clear, you can see oh, his heart cool. flashing. Um, which I finally was able to actually get him to breed. He has um, similar traits to the first. I guess I was told the uh, translucent bearded dragons. The first couple, you know, lines of them. They had their arms kind of splayed out a little bit, and they had trouble breeding. Same thing with him. I actually was lucky to get him after two and a half years of trying. I mean, this is a every three months I'd try and breed him with a female. At nothing, nothing, nothing. Well, one night he finally was actually able to spawn with one of the albino female, females, and uh, which this was about three and a half to four months ago, and I got 70 mutants from that spawn. And oh, it's just like a, wow. And um, I got frogs that have one red eye, one blue eye, uh, translucent. You can see all the way through them, even on the sides of their body. You can see their intestines. You can see the bone structure. You can see the veins, the blood vessels. They're pretty unique. Wicked. They're, wow. They're, they're interesting. So next I'm, I'm year, having I'll, flashbacks of uh, dissecting frogs in high school. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. With these, you don't even need to dissect them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I took a few of them to the Pomona show. Um, I even took one to the Sacramento show, but it was just a clear belly one. But you can see their hearts beating and flashing. And wow, that's uh, cool. Is there any way you can uh, grab some pictures of those, Mike? And um, yeah, we love. Yeah, I like. We'd all like to see them on the. Uh, on the uh, even the late night Leos page, you go ahead and post them up on there if you can. Um, you yeah. know the late night Leos uh, uh, community page because then that way we're most of us there have different animals and we enjoy all animals for the most part. You know, I mean we're leopard gecko community, but we we do enjoy and and like seeing what everybody else is working with. So go ahead and post up some pictures of what you got. You know, just just to show everybody else, hey, look, this is out there too. Okay. What, yeah, what, not a problem. What, what happens if you breed a, a mutant to a mutant? That's the one thing that I haven't had a chance yet. That's I've never been able to find female mutants for sale. And that's simply because Frogs they're not in turtles. 40 years. Do what now? Frogs turn into turtles, right? Yeah. Teenage mutant into turtles. <laughs> yeah, they disappear. <laughs> but, Sorry. Yeah, I've never, I've never had the chance to uh, find and actually use a female mutant for breeding, and now I actually have a few of them that are almost sub-adult size. 
So within the next six months or so, they'll be able to breed. And I'll find out what mutant to mutant does. It may be a you know trait where none of the offspring live, or it may produce stuff that you've never seen before, just because I've never had the genes to actually do it. Um, well, that's we'll, cool. Uh, we'll see what it does. I'm sending yeah. you guys a couple pictures right now of some mutants, so you can see it's on the the Jagged Edge Facebook page real quick. I just sent three of them. I'm not sure if they'll send before we get off the phone or not, but yeah, no, if it doesn't pop it up, let me know. I'm sure Jeremy will share them. <laughs> yeah. You know, man. Come on, I'm always on it. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for sharing those. Yeah, not a problem. I sent three uh, pretty unique frogs. I I keep, you know, I have a warehouse up here, and I keep a few frogs at home. Some of the, you know, real special ones are very, very odd ones here at my house here. So I do bring a few things home with me. Everybody's always wondered that. Do you, do you keep frogs at your house? Eh, some. Well, yeah, I would. Some of them, yeah. <laughs> of course, my my I have a gecko room in my house, so yeah. <laughs> what's what's a frog? What the heck? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. When they, however, when they breed uh, and the males start calling, your neighbors are not going to like you. Oh yeah, are they? <laughs> I wonder if I got a male. <laughs> You'll be okay with one, but if you put them in a rain chamber, you're not going to. Um, your neighbors yeah. won't like you the following morning. Oh, a certain time of the year. Well, I, I'm way up here in uh, the Sierras up here. Certain times of the year, you can hear the frogs outside. We get, I don't know, some kind of tree frogs everywhere. And you can you go outside and you can hear them. And I love it. it oh, yeah. To sleep. It's really yeah. nice, actually, just to sit there and listen to them. Especially if you're, you know, by one of the parks that have ponds and stuff like that. It's real nice. Yeah, no, I, I I like like the sound. I even like crickets chirping. Yeah, yeah. It it beats the sirens and everything else I had to listen to down in Southern California. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it never stops down here. There's helicopters flying over. Yeah, and for people, it never stops. Yeah, I I remember. I, I grew up in uh, Fountain Valley and Huntington Beach. Oh, okay. And Anna- and a crime before I moved up here. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, I used to be on uh, Ball and Brookhurst right by Disneyland. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was off uh, Orangewood and... Uh, what's that other street? Tella? Haster. Haster. Okay. No, yeah, Orange, right. Orange... Yeah, yeah, we lived in the Haster Woods right there. Oh, okay. crime, Crime-ridden place. We lived there for a while. <laughs> oh, it's all... Uh, it's interesting uh, down that area now. Yeah, there's it's there's something going on every night. Oh yeah. You know, shooting, stabbing, all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> yep. All fun. Hmm. I lived all over that place. Hmm. Yeah, I kind of I moved away from it. It's nice, quiet where I'm at now, and easy to keep stuff. No yeah, problem. Yeah, no, I. I like Victorville, Hesperia, all that high desert area is really nice. Yeah, it's a little bit it's more serious. It's grown a lot, though, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of people up here, a lot of housing now, but it's it'll slowly move its way out to Vegas, and eventually there's not going to be an empty stretch of desert going out there, but it'll take time. Yeah. yeah. Like most of California? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The, the one faster down it grows, the, the the bigger it gets, the faster it grows. It's just you oh, know, yeah. it's even it's even happening up here. Is it? Oh yeah, it's well, not not so much here, but uh, down in Chico, it's it's even growing. Hmm. I'm yeah. I'm in Miguelia. Oh okay. Up by Paradise. Yeah. Huh. I thought of moving back east to South Carolina or Florida. I haven't decided yet. That's a long ways away. Is that where I you're in originally? No, from Riverside, actually. I'm from down here. It just It's uh, more or less kind of for the frogs. Um, certain species that I want to get into, I'd like to be able to just to greenhouse breed them, the different tree frog species and stuff like that, and keep half of it outdoors and half of it, you know, indoors, and it's, 
it's hard when you're up in the high desert when it gets 114 to 118 degrees sometimes. Yeah, and you get the the night night drop too, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's chilly up there. Yeah, it'll get. Uh, we get snow up here too. Yeah, I don't like that stuff. No. I get it here too. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it doesn't. Uh, the frogs don't like it either. So. Yeah. Can Can you have Pac Man frogs in Florida? I know they. Yeah. Because uh, I know they've outlawed all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah, California. I think's getting the picking on a lot more species here soon. Yeah, I'm sure. It's, you know, you can't keep a lot of stuff, which is kind of disappointing because a lot of it's actually, you know, really nice to have as pets and, you know, educational animals and it kind of pushes everybody away from, you know, grasping, hey, you know, animals are good, you know, it's a good thing to have, kind of good thing yeah. to cherish. And, and you have all these th- things, all these uh, things attacking it against it. It's hard to oh, yeah. ed- educate people when you know the, the big lawmakers are saying no. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 a hobby. You know, it's something that not every kid, but a good majority. Hey, you know, they like dogs, they like cats, some like fish, some like you know turtles, snakes, lizards, geckos, frogs. You know, it keeps kids busy. The ones that don't oh, play yeah. sports, or even the ones that do, you know, don't have that extra hobby after school. This gives them something to do. Something to, um, you yeah, know, gives them direction. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. No, it's, I, yeah, I, I, God, I got into reptiles when I was real young, and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it kept kept me busy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. My my dad down here used to have a store years and years ago, and he used to import in the '90s when you could bring in the sulcatas from Ghana and all the different countries in Africa and stuff like that. I remember going to the airport at LAX and picking up huge crates with sulcata tortoises in them. And yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty fun back then. You could have a lot of stuff, but you know, I remember him getting, like, uh, Nile crocodiles even, little baby Nile crocodiles in. And yeah, no, I, I remember Southern California, you could pick up uh, South American caiman, American alligators, you know, 10 bucks, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, 20 bucks. Yeah, and, uh, and now whatever we have here, it's you know it's, everything's kind of bottlenecked. Yep. You know we we have to work with the genetics we have here. Yeah. How, how about the the frogs? Are you are you still able to import them from Argentina or wherever they're from? Paraguay um, shut down this last year. I was supposed to get a shipment of stuff, but it ended up getting sent back because uh, it came to one of the importers under false paperwork. Um, the uh, person that was shipping it wasn't legit, and uh, all the animals got sent back, but I was looking, you know, for adult budget frogs I was getting in, um, Pac-Man frogs. I've, I've been searching for about three years to try and get wild-caught Pac-Man frogs, just the Cranwells, because uh-huh. um, Philippe and Bob Mayhew are, you know, good friends of mine, and Philippe said, Mike, if you can get a hold of some wild-caught Pac-Man, try and breed them to these samurai colors he said you'll get the craziest colors you've ever seen and i've been you know clawing my way to figure out hey who's bringing stuff in and you know i sell to a lot of the host stores, but they say nothing's coming out of paraguay it's locked up and is, uh, is that where most of it was coming out of paraguay yeah the, the cranwells will come out of paraguay um the cornuda pac-man frogs they come out of suriname which, you know, for those listening, I do not suggest getting a wild-caught adult Cornuta. Um, they'll they'll be good. They'll be okay for about three to four months. And for some reason, just one day, they end up dead. And you can treat them and do all this stuff. And it's still, for some reason, they just don't they don't make it. Um, which yeah. is sad because they're an awesome species. Um, there's a few of them. Uh, Kim at Frog Ranch, he's figured out how to keep and you know, be able to reproduce them. Um, but, you know, of course, that's a technique that's kept secret. Nobody else knows how to do it. It's it's uh, when you figure out how to do it, you kind of keep it to yourself um, as far as the Surinams go. But I haven't had much luck with them. I've gotten them to spawn a few times, but all the wild-caught stuff year in and year out, for some reason, does not make it, yeah. which is, you know, disappointing. Yeah. Do you, do you work with, uh, like, dart frogs and all the all the other stuff, too? Um, not dart frogs. I used to keep a couple as a pet, you know, just pets and to have them in a tank display and, 
Um, I kind of, when I got more Pac-Man frogs, I kind of went away from the darts because they're a little more tedious for me. Um, I, I would pay less and less attention to the darts, but I was having, you know, 1,300 Pac-Man frogs at that time. So I was spending, you know, seven to eight hours a day caring for Pac-Mans, and then I'd forget about my dart frogs. So I went away from the darts. I kind of keep stuff that um, is similar to the Pac-Mans as far as frog-wise goes. The tomato frogs, I keep those. Um, they're real simple, similar care to the Pac-Mans, throwing crickets, and they eat guaranteed. I mean, they're just like a clock, just constantly eating. Um, my budget frogs, I like those. I uh, I have a couple of them. They get real big. They get just as big as the Pac-Mans. And uh, they're actually one of my favorite frogs. They're mostly aquatic, but what's neat about them is you can tong train them to where they'll see the food under the water and they'll swim up towards the top towards you and almost breach out of the water like a shark would um, to grab awesome. the they'll grab They'll grab the food right off the tongs just like that. I, uh, you know, and they're, they're, they're a vocal frog too. When you pick up the budget frogs, they'll do a real scream sound, which is pretty funny. I uh, happened to post a video on my, my business page and ended up getting like 100,000 views in like two weeks of this frog just screaming. It was pretty funny. <laughs> Mike, where can we uh, find you, by, by the way? Oh, on, uh, you can find me on Facebook. It's under Mike's Fat Frogs, which which is uh, P-H-A-T. Um, you can find me under Mike Matson on Facebook. I do have a web page. I don't use it very much because it's, I'm starting to go through and update it again. But it's uh, Mike's Fat Frogs, uh, dot Weebly dot com, And uh, that will be updated here within the next month or so. I kind of went away from my website skills and I need to take some new pictures of all the new morphs and post some new stuff up there so I've been kind of waiting to do that. Do do you ship a lot of them? Yes. Yeah, I mean yeah. last last week I think I shipped about 300 frogs. Oh, wow, I guess so, you do. Yeah, I go, <laughs> I go through, collection of leopard geckos. I go through a lot of frogs. I I usually sell about 1500 to 2000 frogs a month. Wow. Oh my gosh. Are, are you selling to breeders or newbies or just whoever happens to knock on your front door? Kind of everybody. A majority of the business is wholesalers. I love selling to wholesalers. They'll take between one and 500 frogs, uh, which makes it real easy. You know, I just go to the airport and I ship to airlines to airlines when I get larger orders like that. And then I'll get, um, you know, stores. I had a store that ordered 100 frogs, which is very rare for a pet store to do that. Um but then a lot of customers, you know, most of my customers, they'll buy one frog. And they kind of go, you know what, I really love this. How about I get this color and this color now? And everybody, <laughs> they'll have, and you, it'll happen to you too. You'll have one, and you go, you know what, I really like that. I want this color and this color next. And then you'll see, oh, here's a blue frog. I want that color now. It's uh, nope. You have a bag of Skittles. <laughs> Yeah, they're very addictive frogs. It's it's pretty funny. I mean, they they don't require much care, um, but they're uh, they're pretty addictive. People love them. No, I I really I really like the one I got. I've been looking at all of them, going, oh man, and I'm <laughs> look, looking at looking around. Well, I think I got room for one right there. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's a corner that's empty. I want to fill that corner up. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, yeah. that's. Same thing with the leopard gecko things. You know, you just start off with a few, and, and then once you hatch your first egg, it's like, oh my god! Oh yeah, <laughs> the yeah, addiction people. sets in. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's you know it's a good thing for kids to start. You know, leopard geckos, Pac-Man frogs, ball pythons, corn snakes—they're all good starter species. Oh yeah, not only that, but they, they you know, if, if they go that step further and learn about genetics and, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, they learn a little bit about geography, where they're from, and you know, if they do some research. But the the thing is to plant that seed and to get them interested in something other than um, the garbage that goes around in society these days. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, even some of the TV shows now have just completely changed to. How they were ten, fifteen years ago. Oh yeah. Yeah, and not for the better either. No, you know I've 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 talked to a couple. I posted a picture of my daughter about six months ago. She was uh, laying down and she had a little bumblebee ball python, you know, down by her waist. And 
it was a real cute picture, and uh, I posted it, and I actually had, uh, do you remember, uh, what was his name, Snake Master Austin Stevens that was on TV? Yeah. Do you remember him? Yeah. He, he had the little logo that would pop up with him and a King Cobra and the little title and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And he's uh, he's South African. Well, he actually saw that picture and contacted me, and he asked, hey, can I borrow this picture? And, uh, oh, that's cool. You know, that was, was kind of cool for him to do that. And, uh, I, you know, I started talking to him a little bit. I said, hey, you know, is there, you know, my daughter's two years old, and I have to buy all your guys' stuff, your DVDs and all that, to actually see those shows again. Is there any way that you guys can get your stuff back onto, you know, the different, you know, Animal Planet and, you know, Discovery and stuff like that? And he said they don't have any control of it. Once, once their you know goes, once their time's up, that it's on you know the different TV shows to put it back on. They don't have any control. Of it. And he was you know disappointed that you know all the educational stuff has kind of disappeared from that now, where it's more yeah, where, I mean, it's, where we're it's almost trying scripted. to scare everybody. Yeah, it's all reality, um, basically a sitcom of people killing gators and yep. chasing turtles and just. Yeah, it's it's really sad. Mhm. It's just you know, I have uh I went out and bought, you know, some of Steve Irwin's DVDs and stuff like that. And my wife's Australian, she's actually from Australia. And uh oh. she she met Steve Irwin, Bindi and you know, all of them years and years and years ago oh, when she man. was younger. And she said it was a, oh, such a cool, cool experience. You know, yeah, and that would... and she's She's not into the animals as much as I am. She'll look at them, you know, and she'll hold her little Australian tree frog that she has here and stuff like that. But, you know, that that experience to anybody here that grew up seeing him, you know, a lot of people would do a lot of things just to be able to stand in the same room with Steve Irwin, you know, just oh, to be yeah. around him, you know. And it's, it's disappointing that that stuff's not shown anymore because there's a lot of really neat species out there, you know, that people could just have simply as pets, you know. Yeah, they they should have more yeah. more educational stuff. I mean, even uh, going back, I grew up with um, Marlon Perkins and Wild Kingdom mm-hmm. by Mutual Yeah, Omaha. Wild. Yep, yep. I remember that one. Yeah, yeah and then I used Omaha. to love that stuff. You know, now the stuff they have on now, it's just I don't know. It's not educational. It's it's not even entertaining for me. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know. <it's, laughs> No, because no, you know we. Know. I still see Steve Irwin on uh, Sunday mornings. I usually um, I'm watching him. It's uh, I think it's every every Saturday morning or Sunday. I think it's Sunday morning. Is it on his, his old program still revolve around on on Animal Planet? Is it is yeah. it early in the morning? Uh, probably right around seven eight ish. Okay. Yeah, I think it's on there. Even, uh, I mean, some of the Jeff Corwin shows and uh, what, yeah. Nigel, Nigel Marvin, um, all those uh-huh. were good shows. Yeah, no, all, all the educational stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, yeah, I miss I miss all that kind of stuff. I, I, I could sit down and watch a marathon of all those. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you absolutely. know. Yeah. Jeff, you need Netflix, man. Get Netflix. That's, I just got it, and oh right. my gosh, there is. So much documentary animal stuff on there. It's going to take me probably the good part of the rest of this year to get through all of these <laughs> documentaries. I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's so many animal documentaries on here that are good, not just this reality garbage. Yep. Yeah, there's uh, all different stuff with David Attenborough on there, and uh, yeah, yep. it's another all good one. Yep. Jeff Jeff Collins. Yeah, I, on yeah there. I, like I said, I just oh man, I'm so anxious to actually. Uh, who would have thought I want to sit down and actually watch TV rather than go outside and do it? But and there's so much cool stuff on there that it's, it seems like I have to catch up on the last 15 years of of bad TV. Yeah. Maybe I better not get it. I, I'll stay out yeah. for <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, No, I can't hey, make it out there. Year for you anyway. <laughs> no, not really. It's, it's fall. We got leaves. We got. Well, when it's snowing, what are you going to do? You're not going to mow a lawn. No, I'm not. I'm not leaving the house unless I have to. <laughs> Netflix, buddy. Netflix. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. And gecko, gecko bin cleaning time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Never ends. <laughs> yeah. 
So, Mike, what other so, uh, what other kinds of Pac-Man frogs are there, or are they are they all called Pac-Man frogs? Like, like I know you know from uh, different countries and stuff like that. Is it all a type of Pac-Man frog, or is it are they called Pac-Man frogs? Are they called something else, like ornates or or something like that? Or what are what are the different species? They're all Pac-Man frogs, but there's basically like little subspecies. There's seven different ones. Um, there's ornates, which is ornatus. There's uh, one type that came in, which is the Josarensis, which they're kind of, they're very similar to the Arita. Um, I've had both of them. I do have Josarensis still. They're they're one of the prettiest ones, just a basic color morph. They're bright golds and bright greens, and um, there's there was only a few of those that came in the country, and uh, they came in by accident, and we've managed to actually breed those and keep them around. Um, a good portion of that work was done by Bob and Philippe um, down at Sandfire Dragon Ranch. They they kept that species around. Um, the Arita, which is bred by Kim at Frog Ranch, they're another type. They're out of Brazil. Um, there's uh, the Pacific Horn Frogs, which is the Stolzmanai. They're they're a dwarf. They're very small. I have adults of those, and they're about the size of a half dollar. They're very very small Pac-Man frogs. They are. Um, hmm. Yeah, they're they're tiny. They give they lay between fifty and one hundred and fifty eggs. Um, they're very neat though. They are active, icy little frogs. And I actually was able to get a hold of a couple more adults here this last week, and they'll be coming here on Tuesday. So hopefully, I can start getting those out to the general public. They've been kind of kept back for you know for the specialists and the breeders and stuff like that. Where we haven't really kind of pushed those out there to the general public. Where they're not advertised. You know, you got to kind of know someone to get that type. Um, let's see, there's, uh, the Surinams, which is known also as Cornudas, and then I believe, which one am I missing here, those are the Chacos, which are another type that I haven't seen in a long time, there is, uh, breeding groups of them in Japan, um, hopefully this next year I'll be able to import some, but they're, they're still pretty expensive, just the average normal color Chaco pack, man, frog is $200 wholesale a baby. Wow. wow. So it's, it's 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 quite a, you know, adventure to go out and get enough of them to raise up for a breeding group. Um and then to be able to produce them in the amount to bring the price down for the, you know, average consumer to say, "Okay, you know, it's 75 bucks here reasonable for this type of species." Um that's, you know, the end goal is to eventually have that. I'm I've had six of the seven species and then there's um a fantasy, which is a hybrid between the Cornudas and the Surinams. Excuse me, the do, Cornudas and the Cranwelli. Um, do people frown on hybrid hybrid? Not, not <laughs> no, because actually the uh, the fantasies v- look similar to the Cornudas, but they uh, uh, they they're very good feeders. They survive, um, and that's kind of the reason why they are created. Because the Cornudas were so hard to keep alive that no one, you know, no one, they started losing interest. But the fantasies keep that same physical, you know, phenotype-looking characteristics as the Cornudas. There's little subtle differences like the throat on a fantasy. It's more of a, almost, uh, it's not a solid color, but it has like little patches of white through it. Whereas a Cornuda is going to have a solid black to brown throat. Um, uh. Same thing with the pattern on the back. I call it a butterfly pattern. The cornudas are a little bit spaces in between the patterns, and the fantasies have kind of more of a butterfly look on the back of that the two patterns that you'd see on each side. Um, and then I've had hybrids of ornates and the josarensis, which those are the only ones that have ever produced eggs. The fantasies are sterile. Um, I bought a pair of adult hybrids from Philippe a couple years ago. He was able to get them to reproduce. I was able to get them to reproduce, you know, very, very small fertility. Um, But that pair, you know, the female ended up passing away a couple months after breeding Um, for no reason, just, you know, simple thing is it could have had a heart attack or something like that. There's no obvious looking issues with it. Um, I just haven't gone back to, you know, doing the hybrids of those. But the the main Pac-Man frogs out there are the Cranwells and the Ornates. Wow. So, so when you um, 
uh, basically incubate the eggs. You don't have any control over male, female. It just whatever no. you get. I mean, it's yeah. not temp- temperature, sex, or nothing. No, and it's it's such a quick hatch rate that it shocks most people. Um, for example, from say they start laying eggs at you know nine o'clock at night, and the female's done by say midnight, spitting out her eggs. Uh-huh. By the following night, midnight, all of them are tadpoles. Wow. It's a 12 to 24 hour time period of they're actually going to be tadpoles. Wow, and they don't get fertilized until until she's laying them, right? Yeah. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, it's such a quick process. It's, it's you would think it'd take a so, week or they're 24 hours and they're already swimming. Wow. Which is, that is I, would, I, would, I would like to get one of those cameras that does the overtime delays just to put it oh, on the one time, edge. Time time lapse thing. Yeah, I see the time lapse yeah. it's changing because it's. A, it's actually a neat little process. I'll check on them every four to six hours, and you know, once you're about nine to twelve hours in, you can tell which ones are fertile and which ones aren't because they'll start changing shape. They'll kind of split at about four and a half to six hours, and then they'll go to a straight line um, at you know nine to twelve, and then once it hits sixteen hours, they're they're already tadpole shaped, getting ready to start moving. When they eat their way out of the egg, don't they eat the membrane or something like that? It, you know, I can't see. It's such a small. It's they're very small. It's hard to see what exactly they're doing. I honestly not sure. Um, huh. But it seems that they do. They have a membrane that they're sticking to. I use a false crate bottom, and the ones that the eggs that stick to the crate, you can actually see like a membrane of some sort that they're in when they're changing shape. Um, so I'm assuming they do eat out of that membrane. They'll last on their egg yolk for about 24 hours, and then they want to start feeding. Wow. What do you, what do you feed the tadpoles? You can do a few things. Um, live blackworms are the best thing to feed them. Uh, you can do frozen bloodworm pieces. You can do um, a Tuba few other things. Can you do, fro- fro- can you do yeah. freeze-dried bloodworms? You can. Um, they they Just honestly rehydrate them, don't of course. Yeah, they just – the only thing that the tadpoles start real well off of is the blackworms. I've I've tried, a, you know, multiple different diets to try and start tadpoles to see which one they're, you know, strongest, you know, growing on. Um, and it seems just the blackworms. Nothing beats the blackworms. For some reason, the blackworms are the best. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. I bet your feeder bill is through the roof too, huh? No, it's not too bad. I I go directly to the sources, so I, yeah. for example, I mean, my blackworms are, you know, 75% less than what they are in the store. They're, you know, well, yeah, $15, you're... $15 a pound in the store, and I pay nothing near that. Um, but I'll also yeah. go through six to eight pounds in a day. Dang, that's a, that's a lot of worms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have a fridge full of worms. I'm sure you probably have a fridge just for the frogs, huh? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. They, they. Uh, I have a deep freezer for all the the frozen rodents and uh, two fridges for all the worms, and they go through them. That's that's amazing. Yeah, no kidding. Huh. But, how how big is your warehouse? Your setup for them? It's uh, 1,500 square feet, so it's uh. Like a 25 by, I want to say 75, somewhere in there. Wow. It's around that. It's a little bit different shaped. It's like a 25 to 30 by like 60 to 70 foot, somewhere in that range. And I have a, a front office is where the snakes stay, and then the frogs get the whole back space. Snakes, what snakes frog do you <laughs> uh, Let's see. I have, uh, mainly I have... Kenyan sand boas. I just started getting into those. Uh, about four weeks ago, I had none. At the Sacramento show, I bought a group of them, and now I have about 37 adults <laughs> in four weeks. <laughs> I went from nothing to a whole lot of them. Um, and then I have a pair of rosy boas that's uh, a Yorba Linda rosy boa pair, which you can't find those. Uh, They're, that whole yeah. area is populated now. You can't find Rosie's low, you know, to that locality anymore. 
Um, no, I used to go out there and catch them. Uh, I've never found a rosy bow in the wild. Oh, yeah. There's there's still some places. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't know about down south, but I know a few around here. I'll, I'll message you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, even even Whitewater, California, that road out there, you can't search off the side of the road anymore. There's a oh really a sign out there. Yeah, there's a sign out there now that was posted this last summer. If you park your car, it's up to a thousand dollar fine, and they'll tow your vehicle. Wow. If you park your no, car, we used to and get go out, out there and get oh horn toads. Mm-hmm. God, there was a ton of stuff out there. King snakes, just everything. <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's been picked pretty dry now. I mean, I've I've never seen anything on it. I've gone up and down there a couple times and never found anything. But now the wind farm companies own the own the land off the road, and they're. Oh. I went up there um, at the end of the Whitewater Canyon. There's a um, a ranger station. And I went up there and I asked the lady, I said, you know, are we allowed to still search off of this road here? And she said, you can look on the road, but she said, I would not advise getting out of your car and walking onto the side where the rocks are because the windmills own that company and they're prosecuting people for going on that property. Oh, that's kind of good in a way because the stuff that's still there could probably, um, um, you know, thrive. It has a chance, yeah, it has a chance to repopulate, but... I thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah, we used to go out there with pillowcases and just, you know, go with empty pillowcases and come back with just all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. But huh. back then, you you could sell native to the pet stores. Yeah. Um, that all went away, I don't know, back in the 70s, late 70s probably. Hmm. Yeah. Early 80s. It, hmm. Uh, it was late seventies. I don't. I don't remember exactly. But I. I, I was still in high school. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't here yet. Mm. <laughs> I kind of. I guess I missed all the fun stuff. <laughs> no, in Orange you County was music going. Too, Jeff. What was that music you were telling me about? Uh, was it last week or two weeks ago? You were telling me I should have listened to it. And the guy was was popular before I was even born. Oh, I don't know. I forget who it yeah, was. Yeah, the the bear, isn't it? <laughs> no, but um, yeah, but when they were when they were just, I would watch the area, and when they go in with the you know the earth movers and everything to 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 grade everything out, I would go into these areas and just wait outside of the areas where they're grading. And, yeah. Um, I mean, the reptiles would run to you. Oh <laughs> but yeah. It, it's it's sad now. It's all concrete jungle, you know, it's yep. houses and businesses everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's hard to find anything here in California, you know, reptile-wise, unless you know of one spot that people haven't gone to. Um, you know, I went I went to Nevada and, and uh, went, my sister-in-law came from Australia and had her birthday in Vegas, but one of the nights I went out and um, went looking out there, and, you know, I find six, seven snakes in one night out there along with geckos and tarantulas and scorpions and stuff like that. Here, I can't find anything. Yeah, down down where you're at, up up here in Northern California, there's, there's still some places. Oh, that's not bad. You just got a, just yeah, got a pet tarantula out back door. Oh, yeah? <laughs> no, I, they uh, live in the water meter, you know where the water meter is yeah. in the ground? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I go out there and throw them roaches and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that keeps them there. Yeah. Not, I don't know if he's still out there. Yeah. I do landscape work, so anytime I go to shut up the water main or anything to do sprinklers, I I run across them now and then. I run across yeah. all kinds of weird stuff in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh. Yeah, well, well, the big place uh, to look in Nevada is, is in those water main, those meter shutoff valves. Is you find frogs and scorpions and like oh, yeah. tarantulas, all sorts of stuff in there. That's the best place to find them. Yeah. Yeah, there's I moisture and hopes for the leaks from the pipes. Yeah. Yeah. Condensation even Bugs. because of temperatures. Yeah. Everything hides in those. Yeah. yeah. But. um yeah, going back to the the stuff, the snakes that I have, just mainly the rosies. I have one pair of those. I have a lot of sand boas, 
I have uh, one baby uh, green anaconda male, which is uh, he's oh. real neat. He's real nice. He's real tame. I've, he hasn't tried to bite or nothing. He's actually a pretty nice little animal. Keep holding him. Yeah, the more you hold him, him. The, the, the nicer he'll stay. <laughs> don't, yep. don't forget to hold him. Yeah, always. I, always lo- I love them. anacondas. They're they're Keep real neat, you know. If if you don't know what you're doing, they're not something to have. But if you know, you know how to. You don't associate yourself with food. We'll put it that way. You kind of let them yeah. have their own thing, and you don't sit there and hand feed it, you know a green anaconda. It's not a real good idea. Yeah, because that snake does get big. Yeah, that's one of the biggest, right? That the, or, yeah. Oh, the yellow There's, anaconda. Yeah, the the green's the biggest. The yellows aren't too bad. The yellows, I think, top out at like. I want to say ten to twelve feet for females. The males still stay around six or eight for the green, for the yellows. But um, mm. yeah, I used to I used to have reticulated pythons. I had some big ones of those, some eighteen, nineteen foot tiger retic females. Um, but I ended up getting rid of those. I used to have a a real big rock python female, but she's now at the Denver Zoo. Um, she was she was an aggressive snake. Yeah. It's- Kind of goes with the rock pythons. Oh yeah, yeah, and they had a yeah. they had a big fifteen foot male there at that zoo, and I happened to go to a Denver show, and the guy asked me, "Hey, do you have any you know rock python females?" I said, "Yeah, I got a big female at home. You guys want it?" I said, "Absolutely." So. Oh, cool. I think, were, I think they were doing some sort of breeding program with them, and and uh, figuring out like the aggressiveness and all that as as far as babies, like if anything passes on through the babies and it was it was a weird project that the the two particular guys that were doing but i have trying to try to read the the aggressive out or yeah i mean i've seen rock pythons that are you know puppy dog tame they're real nice and then i've seen some that are you know not so nice but i guess that's with every species oh yeah it's with everything mm-hmm. but yeah a little green anaconda male he's pretty nice that's cool. Like no, you got, uh, got your hands on some cool stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. I would have more, but you know the state of California doesn't allow. Yeah. Well, hey, oh, I, yeah. I noticed you have uh, pixie frogs, the African bullfrog. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, well, uh, tell us, tell, give us a rundown on them. Um, I used to keep a, a pretty large group of them, and I went to Australia for about two months, and I ended up selling the group off before I left. Um, but I've recently started, you know, buying more adults and growing them up. And I should have a pretty big colony of them here by next year. Hopefully, around 50 to 100 adults. Um, they're a they're a great pet. They're um, very easy to keep. They're pretty much bulletproof. Um, they're very aggressive as babies, constantly eating. They're you don't have really any of the feeding difficulties um, on those as you would some other species. The females will get about softball size, and the males, I've had males that weigh up to like four and a half pounds. Holy moly. And for a frog, that's a pretty good size frog. You know, it'll be seven and a half, eight straight length size. Yeah, do but, they, um, do, do they, is there different morphs of the pixies? I've just seen the big, I don't know, they just look like wild type. Yeah, there, there's kind of an a army few. Green. Yeah, there's a few. Yeah. Um, Philippe put out a book a couple years ago, and I believe it's on Kindle. You can buy it off of Amazon. It's a great book. I have it. Um, there's a few different morphs, but they're very hard to find. Um, there's high whites, which they're green, but the the body, the actual pattern on them with the green kind of bars that you'll see going down adult pixies, the tops of those are white, paper white. Um, I used to have cool. a couple of those. I have one now, but she's a younger female. Um, those are very hard to find. You'll see some olive-colored ones. Um, there's there's more of a uh, the size difference. There's big-headed pixies, which, you know, the male's heads will be about three to four inches across. And then there's the small head type also, which the males are only about a two-inch head, di- you know, across length. Um, hmm. There's There's different localities of pixies. Some of them we can't get, like uh, Mozambiques. Those are those are pretty neat. The Tanzanian pixies also. Um, there is a pixie frog in Africa that I haven't been able to get a hold of, but they're black, and they have a golden chest. Oh wow! 
but they come from a country where you can't export. So it's it's uh, you just can't get them right now. So hopefully one day they open up to where you can get those. Um, and then there's you know the dwarf pixies. There's two types of those. There's the Edelis, and then there's the Tanzanian. Um, the Edelis get a little bit bigger, more of like a softball size for adult males, females around baseball size. But those are very few and far in between now. But the the common dwarfs, you know, they get about baseball size for adults. They're 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 a nice frog, they're good feeders. Um, if you just want something that stays in a ten gallon tank, the dwarf pixies are perfect. The the giants they need at least a twenty long for adults, but they're always real good aggressive feeders and they're actually real fun pets. Now I've always always enjoyed the frog things. Mm. Catching catching the polywogs and tadpoles and putting them in a fish tank and raising them out. Oh yeah, yeah, it's always always cool stuff. Yeah, so with the, the the Pac-Man frogs, you house them alone, right? You don't want yeah, to house all the two adults, Yeah, all the adults are all kept separate. I have um, just a moment here. I have a uh, hundred ten-gallon tanks that I've set up in a system to where they all flush clean out and um one of my employees goes through once a week and you know goes through and clean sanitizes every tank takes all the takes all the frogs out and we go through everything i keep all the adults um on a foam that i have and it's uh it's yeah, an I imported it. yeah it's an imported foam that i get in um it's real clean. It washes off. You never have to buy another piece unless somehow you tear it up. The frogs don't do anything to it. They'll pee and it goes through the foam, and they can't sit in it. And when they, you know, defecate, it sits on top of the foam. All you do is pull the foam piece out, wash it off, put it back in, and it's reusable. And as long as you keep a water dish, you can add, you know, moss on top of the foam and stuff. But I found that the foam keeps a lot of the basic issues away from the frogs. You don't see them sitting in their own feces because they can't. You know, the 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 liquid goes beneath the foam and kind of trickles down through to the bottom of the tank where they can't get to it. Um, it's, it's real simple, and that's what I keep. Half the tank is foam, and the other half is a bare glass that goes to a drain hole, and it's, it's all hooked up kind of. It's very similar to like a fish tank system, how all my adults are. Um, a big, but a big hydro, hydroponic system, kind of. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Except I don't let them sit in water. Um, I try to do half of tank in water and half in foam, but the bacteria buildup and stuff like that causes the frogs to get a lot of eye infections and you know shedding problems and stuff like that. So I give them a water dish that's changed out every other day. And then that foam sits in there. The water dish is cut out in between. And I'll take a picture and send it to you guys so you can post it for everybody that, you know, is uh, listening right now. But yeah, it's no. uh, the adults, that's how I keep the babies. I keep them a little more simple. Um, certain ones, depends if I'm holding them back, they'll go in two and a half. To, and those are all foam with a water dish cut out. And I clean those, you know, every three days, the tank itself. And just empty it out, squeeze the sponge out, rinse it. And uh, it saves the mess of the cocoa fiber and stuff like that. But it's yeah. easier for me to do that. It's not something that, you know, someone that has one to ten frogs should do. It's it's um, It just saves me time. I used to spend eight to nine hours a day, and now I spend an hour to two hours, if that, cleaning everybody. Yeah, no, if if you have that better. many, I'm sure... I'm, I'm sure you got to find out. You know, you know your you, your husbandry probably evolves as you go along. I yeah, know mine has with what I do. <laughs> oh yeah, yep. And it's you know each the frogs. I don't heat each tank. I heat the building itself, so the building's kept at eighty to eighty-two degrees. Um, the summertime, I'll I'll turn the heat and leave the heater off, and it stays. It stays pretty warm here during the summer. It'll stay, you know, 86 to 92 degrees during the day outside. And the warehouse fluctuates from, you know, 80 to 85. And it doesn't really change besides that. So I'll go off of everything, leave everything shut off. And the um, I have, you know, windows on the warehouse. So all the lights, they pretty much see everything that's outside. You know, if we have 16 hours a day or 10 hours or 12, whatever it is, 
they get all that light that comes in. So they kind of a natural cycle to what's going on outside here. Do they breed to the photo period? Is that sometimes? Does it have um, a lot to do yeah. with the breeding? Yeah, you'll see the females. Um, a lot of my females, I figured out ways to try and see when they have eggs inside of them, and I've noticed, you know, the different changes um, to the different seasons. They'll develop eggs. I'll get females that'll that'll develop eggs three times a year. Wow. And they'll lay when they're in the wild. They usually only do it once, maybe twice. Um, but I mean, one, one female will give you 6,000 frogs a year if you get real good spawns out of her, which that's a lot of animals. Yeah, I was just going to say that. So yeah. It's, uh, roughly 6,000 in a year for one female. Yeah. I don't, I don't need to start breeding them. <laughs> no, me neither. Yeah. I, I don't have the room. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of space. I mean, for example, just to keep the baby frogs, they're in 17 of the python tubs that Vision has. Um, they're a three foot by four foot tub. I have 17 of those that keeps the frog with. How many froglets know. can you keep together? Um, usually, I try and keep about 150 in a tub. <laughs> they, do they yeah, start cannibali- so cannibalizing each other? Not <laughs> too bad. Like one. I've, I've I've found different ways to kind of keep them from doing that. If you keep them in a substrate where they can bury down like a moss. I love the New Zealand sphagnum moss. I never have issues with it. Um, uh-huh. That they, they do real good on that. It's real easy to keep, you know, moist. It doesn't dry out too fast. Um, they'll just kind of sit in their own little area. As long as you're pumping them with crickets, giving them crickets, um, they're fine. When I get down to the, about the last 400 frogs, I'll individually cup everybody, which that's a process itself. Um, yeah. But by the by the time I get down to 400 frogs, you know, in a month, they've they've got some good size on them. They're you know a half dollar size frog, and they can eat each other a lot easier. Um, so I uh, I'll cup them all, and then I'll go through and and mix up. It's it's kind of a unique little way that I do it. I take uh, samurai powder food or Zumed powder food, and I'll mix it up and get it to almost a toothpaste consistency. And I'll use a uh, hand-feeding formula syringe that you would for birds. Um, I think someone there has a cockatiel. I heard a cockatiel earlier. Oh, that's probably me. That's chicken bird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I use a, I use a, you know, a hand-feeding syringe and I'll go through and I'll feed 400 frogs in about an hour and a half with the syringe. Just tap them on the mouth, they open up. I squirt a little pea-sized ball of the food in there, and they're good to go. And they grow really fast on it. But the the last, you know, 400 frogs or so is what I generally try and supply to the public. They're a little bit bigger, um, they're easier, and they you know, well-established by then. Yeah. Oh, that's it's it sounds like quite a process, man. <laughs> when you yeah. have that many, it's a lot of work. It's not a every day yeah. everybody can do type thing. No, it's well, it's like the leopard geckos during, you know, like uh, I don't know, March, May, June. It's like every day I go to the incubator and there's babies and oh yeah, oh man, <laughs> documentation oh. and. Oh, <laughs> Changing, changing out the paper towels, the ones that have already hatched, and moving them up, and it, yeah, it's it, it it can it, if you don't love it, man, then give it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I, I'm yeah. sure you have the you, you have to have a passion for it. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, especially especially the tadpole process. It's about three to four weeks of a lot of work. And, uh, you know, the, the worms itself, the black worms make a mess in the water. The tadpoles defecate in the water. And it, it turns out to be a real fishy smell if you just have freestanding water. And uh, Oh, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> it, it, yeah, you have to hook up filters and not the little fish filters like the fluvols, all those ones, you, they don't do anything. And you, you can't imagine the amount of filth that these things produce when they're, when they're tadpoles. It's uh, every day is constantly changing out filters, you know, flushing the water every three days. Um, once, once I do get settled in and, you know, actually buy a house and put the business there, I'm going to get one of the, the industrial filters 
you know, the real large, large filters that handles thousands of gallons of water and keeps it just crystal clean. Uh, they have them now. The UV rays kill everything in the in the yeah. water. Yeah. yeah, something like yeah. that. I forget. Well, the UV sterilizers, those work real well for kids killing like any of the bacteria and stuff in the water. Um, but a lot of it's just ammonia. And you have to have a good bacteria bed to get rid of that. And it, it takes time. It takes, you know, a couple of weeks to set up a bacteria bed. And then it takes a few weeks past that to set up a bacteria bed that will be able to handle something that produces so much waste like the frogs do. Yeah. It's just yeah, a, that's, that's, that's aqu- a aquaculture process. kind of a thing. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they're, uh, it's it's a lot of work. You know, It's uh, I actually had my warehouse flood a... Uh, Last week, I think it was, I had about a thousand gallons of water on the ground, and oh, I no. couldn't believe it. I showed up at midnight. I was breeding frogs, and one of the pipes on the, thankfully, is an empty tank system, getting ready for you know spawn in a couple of days, and one of the uh, the pipes blew out, and I had a thousand gallons of water across my floor, yeah. and it was about two inches deep, and I found it at midnight. Coming oh, back, Lord. you know, putting frogs together, make sure everybody's breeding okay, and no, you can usually hear the frogs from down the road calling in the warehouse because I had about twelve males in at the time, and uh, no. no one was calling, and I heard water spilling, and I rushed into the door, and I had about two inches of water everywhere across the fifteen hundred oh, square foot warehouse. <laughs> Sounds like the frogs didn't want to be in trouble for it. Well, yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I, you know, I, I didn't do it. Why they're all quiet? They're like, oh, it wasn't me. <laughs> Yeah, they were, they were completely <laughs> silent, and I uh, actually ended up not getting any eggs that night either. It was enough of a distraction, but it took me two hours to squeegee all that water out of the warehouse so it'd be dry the next day. Oh, God. Yeah, but that's what you wanted to do at midnight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, i just show up there to make sure everybody was okay, doing good and laying eggs, and show up to, <laughs> you know, a thousand plus gallons of water on the floor. And no eggs. Holy jeez. Yeah, no eggs. <laughs> So price stre- and stressed yeah. them out, but at least at least it did break when there's no tadpoles in there because that breeding that night was supposed to go on that system. Oh yeah, so that that would have been real bad. Yeah, Quite content so that, off a warehouse floor. Yeah, that would have <laughs> not been good. But you know, breeding frogs is it's difficult. It has its great times and then it has its hard times. You know, you breed a spawn and see the eggs in the female and think, oh, they're going to do great, and then you get one tadpole. Or you'll, you know, the exact opposite. You'll think, oh, you know, this will be an okay spawn, and you'll get three to 5,000 tadpoles between two females. And it just fills up, you know, a little salt pepper look across the whole bottom between the albinos and the other morpha tadpoles. Um, the albino tadpoles are white, and I have a white rain chamber tub. And you can't see them until they're about three days old. So uh, uh. one day I almost flushed a whole tadpole, you know, spawn. I didn't even see them. And I happened just to wait an extra day. I got distracted, came back the next day. I saw about 600 tadpoles swimming around in the water. Couldn't believe it. Oh, you got oh, lucky there, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I didn't even see them. They, just, they were that color that matched the side of the walls, complete white. And I didn't even see them. Usually some of the morphs will have a little bit of like, um, not quite an eggshell look to them, but they'll have kind of like a tan kind of color over some of the white tadpoles where I can see them. But they're impossible to see when they come out. What if you put white. like a black background on them or something? That That's easier for the albinos, but then you can't see the, the other colored tadpoles because the other colors are black. They come out black or white. Oh, <laughs> oh and gotcha. So, and they're all... They're all yeah. Maybe specific. Yeah. yeah, and you know, that's the tubs are made either black or white. I have one company that I need to go back to that molds tubs for me. I'm going to have them do blue. I think that's the only color. I was going to say blue or green, green maybe. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, green, I didn't think about green. That may be easier, too. Some kind of contrast where you can see them. Yeah. Yeah, make it much easier because I almost flushed about 600 tadpoles down that day. And guess what? You would have never known that you did it, and it, you would have just nope. done, done on business as normal. Yep. But it, and, and now that you know, you're yeah, you you kicked yourself now that you know what you were just about to do. Oh yeah. Yep. Gosh. And sometimes, sometimes I'll have stuff hatch a little bit later, 
Um, so I usually, if, if the eggs are in the tub, like right now I have eggs in one of the rain chambers. And to me, it doesn't look like they're fertile, at least today. But I'll wait till tomorrow night to see. And I'm, when I lift up the crate, I may see little tadpoles swimming around. Um, I just, I'll usually leave them in for two or three days before I flush it. But, yeah, that, that one day I couldn't believe I actually saw a whole bunch of them. Wow. So you do a lot of shows, right? You go to sh- How many shows do you do a year? I do about four to six. I'm starting to do oh, four. Next year I want to do uh, Tenley, Ohio. I'd, I'd uh-huh. like to go up to that show, and I'd like to Me also too. do Daytona. I think we'd yeah. all like to go to Tenley. Yeah, it's, I, I missed it this year. You know, August, it got real slow. There wasn't a lot of business in August because it was so hot you couldn't ship anything. It was, you know, 110 to 112 degrees where I'm at on average. Um, but everywhere else it was hot also. And, you know, no one was buying. Everybody was, you know, getting kids back into school and stuff like that. So I stopped breeding. Well, I didn't have anything for Tinley this year, so I didn't bother going. But it'd be, yeah. uh, I'd like to when go you ship- there and check it out. Yeah, when you ship frogs, do you use a um, heat pack, cool pack, or do you use like a Phase 22? Uh, it depends, depends where they're going. Uh, most of the time in California, about 90% of the year, I don't need to use heat packs. Um, I will sometimes have to use cool packs, but I'm in Southern California, you know, the hottest part of California. So right. I, anybody that orders here, I usually will hand deliver it to them. Um as far as, like, say, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, those are always getting heat packs about eight months of the year just because the overnight temps there can get pretty low. And you never know where the yeah. frogs are sitting at night, you know, whether they're in a truck yeah. or in a warehouse. Um, I've heard some of the warehouses aren't heated, some are. So I always pack those. They're always in insulated boxes. Um, Florida is another hard one sometimes because it's so humid and hot where I'll pack them in moss and they'll do just fine, but I don't put heat packs in there. And if you put an ice pack in a real small, like, you know, six inch cube box, you'll freeze the frog also. So I'll take uh, a little Ziploc baggie and throw a couple of ice, you know, blocks inside from the freezer. And um, it'll last, you know, the couple hours that it's going to be here in real warm weather in California. And by the time it gets there, you know, 10.30 in the morning, and Florida's not too bad generally. But I rarely have any DOAs on the frogs. I I ship pretty well. I've had um, some recently get held over. You know, you ship Wednesday, you're supposed to get there Thursday, miss the flight, miss it on Friday, and they never get delivered on Saturday. They'll stay there till Monday. Well, I've had frogs that that's happened to, and they're all alive. Yeah, oh, thank goodness. That's, that's always... Always, man. I only ship Monday through Wednesday, and I I like shipping on the Mondays and Tuesdays. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, it's, I, I I haven't I haven't I haven't had an issue. Knock on wood. I yeah. stress hard when I'm <laughs> shipping stuff out. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it's 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 scary when you know you're shipping to a first time customer, and they you know they even if it's one frog and. You ship on a Wednesday, and the frog's still not there by Saturday. And uh, Monday morning comes around, and you're just hoping it's okay, and it turns out to be just fine. You know, so. Yeah. The well, I'm sure the person on the other end's freaking out, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and you can only do so much when, you know, the warehouses for the shipping places close down. They No one's going to go there and get the box. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, and they don't care. No. <laughs> They're off the clock. Yep, and it's just a uh, punch in and punch what? out. That's why I was. That's why I was saying. Have you heard of the Space Twenty Two packs? Yeah, they last uh, quite a while, don't they? Forever, unless they're punctured or or cut or something, you know, broken. Then they, yeah, they last, and you can keep reusing them and reusing them and reusing them, and they stay really? at the temperature that you pretty much set them at. Yeah. Wow. Huh. Yeah, I, I, no, haven't, I haven't tried those yet, but. No, Josh. Josh Hawley, uh, one of our sponsors. He he's used them and he tested them out for a good week. And he even put the thing in the in the freezer in an insulated box in the freezer at home. Mm-hmm. And he rec- he had a uh, he recorded the temperature and it didn't fall to a lethal level even in the freezer. 
Wow. Wow. And it never got above, I think it was like 86. Huh. In the hottest part of the house, it never got to, it never got above 86. And now is that, is that a heat pack or is, is that kind of a both a heat and cool pack? It's, it's both. It does heating and cooling both. Well, I have to get some of those. Yeah, I guess if it's going if it's going to a cooler place, you throw it on your on your your uh, uh, like a heating something that's warm, and then you set the yeah, temperature yeah. that way and put it in the box, and then you ship it out, and then vice versa. Say say it's going somewhere hot, and you want it cooler, you throw it in the um, in the freezer for a couple minutes, you bring it out, and you put it in the box. I don't know exactly how they work. I've not used them, but I know yeah. I know Josh has used them. Um, another one of our sponsors, um, Luxury uh, Pack Line from Luxurious Leopards. He uses uh-huh. them exclusively. He actually sells them too, so you might okay. want to hit him up and find yeah, out. I'll look at um, Pat, yeah, Pat Klein from Luxurious Leopard uses them exclusively, okay. from what I'm, I'm, I'm understanding. So yeah, that's, that's why I was asking how you ship. Is there's always certain ways that could be better, you know, more and safer yeah. because of the animals, especially if you're getting them, you know, held over because they miss flights. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. Okay. Yeah, I have to look into those. That wouldn't be too bad to have. Is there yeah, like a, a company you go through? Forever. I, Is there I, what I know a company you go through, like we go through like uh, Reptile Express or Ship Your Reptiles. Um, is, is there like a Amphibian Express? Express? <laughs> no, I, I use, um, I'll use, I have an account with both Ship Your Reptiles and an, an account mm-hmm. with uh, Express Reptiles. And then there's another company. Um, that's more of a private, like, individual. And I'll message you guys also about which ones those are because you guys could use those too. But it's all referral-type stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's real easy. It's all reptile-approved and all that, but it's cheap. It's cheap shipping. It's like 35 to $40 for me to overnight a box from here to New York. And that's a six-inch cube box. Well, that's wow. not bad at all. So it's not yeah, too does. bad, but it's... It's all referral because it's um, based off of the guy, you know, you get approved through him, you get approved through his FedEx rep, but also it's on a bill pay system where you don't pay for shipping that day. You don't pay for a week to a week and a half later for it. So it's all on a, you'll get your bill for shipping, say, two to three times a month, but you don't have to pay every time you ship. It just gets all collected up for that week and then passed on for bill payment the next week. You get your bill and then it's not due for the following week. I need that number. <laughs> no, sh- Shipping is, is always a, a deal killer for a, a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, and it's it's good and it's bad because if they can't pay for the shipping, how are they going to pay for the get-go? And I know I've paid yeah. through the nose for shipping. Oh, but um, I, I would ship a lot more if I could bring the prices down a bit. Yeah, I'll send you guys the info. I'll, I'll uh, send it to the Jagged Edge Facebook and whoever's one's yeah. back forward it across and just tell them the guy you know I'll, we'll explain it later i'll explain it to you yeah um or just but yeah, it's, i'll, I'll it's message pretty, you too okay yeah it's it's pretty good uh shipping and you know it's hard when you sell a 30 dollar frog and someone comes to you okay what's the shipping oh well it's 50 dollars you know yeah, yeah. Bucks. they're kind of like well i can go to petco which you know i i supply one of the wholesalers that supplies petco but there's very limited colors that actually go into petco and petsmart so, yeah, right. It's one of those things yeah. that they want the special morph, they kind of have to pay for the shipping. But I had to find a way to knock that price down to where at least, you know, oh, it's a thirty-five dollar frog shipping thirty-five bucks. Not so bad. Where if it's thirty-five and fifty, you're kind of like, nah, never mind. Well, then that's when yeah. you upsell and say, hey, why don't you buy two frogs? Then it'll be worth your while. Oh yeah, yeah. And most, you know, most of the people that I sell to buy between two and twelve. Most of the individuals. That's a lot of frogs. That's how many wow. Yeah, that's and those are just you know every day they just like them as pets. You know they're and they're hobbyist kind of thing. Yep, they're very intriguing animals. Pretty much every every reptile is in its own way. Yeah. No, I I I really like this one. He's he's cool. I go in there. And I've been checking on him before I look in the incubator lately. <laughs> 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 oh no, I said it. Live. Echoes are going to take it out on you. 
Well, Mike, uh, we're coming about to the end of the show. We really appreciate having you on. Um, if there's anything that we can help you with or, or vice versa, you know, if there's some information you want, to, want us to pass along, we can absolutely do that for you. Um, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be in contact. I'm, you know, I'm always watching what you got going on on Pac-Man. What's that, Pac-Man USA? Is that your, is that your yeah. page? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's Pac-Man USA, which I'm an admin of that. Um, there's, uh, Pac-Man Frogs, there's all different sorts of Pac-Man Frog pages from around the world. I'm kind of on most of them. Um, and then another one is uh, Mike's Fat Frogs, you know, the Facebook page. I'll post stuff on there. Um, if you're looking for, you know, real good deals on stuff, there's a page called Reptile Auctions. And I'll post, you know, little yeah. two and three packs, five packs of frogs on there. And you can score a really good deal. You know, they'll be on there for... 60 bucks for five Pac-Man frogs is, you know, what someone won an auction tonight for $60 for five frogs. You know, a real good price right there. Um, it just, uh, it's a couple different Facebook pages, and it's real good information. The Pac-Man Frog USA has uh, husbandry links on top attached to the page, and, you know, everybody posts kind of different pictures and who got what from, you know, where and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I, I looked on the Pac-Man Frogs USA. That's that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a it's a good little site. I've been on there for about two two and a half years now. There's a uh, frogforum.net, which uh, it's kind of a a more of a broad spectrum type. It has you know all your different amphibians and stuff like that on there. That's another page that I used to be on a lot. Now Facebook's real easy to use. It's real quick to update. So I don't go on the other ones as much. But there's a lot of good information on that page also. Nice, nice. Cool. Well, we really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us and going over some some of your uh, fat frogs. Yeah, thanks for yeah. having me on, guys. Stuff like that. No. So, yeah, we really appreciate your time. Thank Not you so much. Anytime. Thank you. You're welcome, Mike, and we will be talking to you, sir. Sounds good. Have a great evening. Thank you again, Mike. You too. Bye, guys. Um, bye. bye. Jeff, what did you think about that? Jeff. Frog, the more I, more hey, I think about it. Hey. What's that now? I'm, I'm liking the, this Pac-Man frogs. Uh, the more more I get into them. I don't think I'm going to breed them, though. That's just way no, too no, many breeding. Days. Yeah, breeding is absolutely another question for me. There's no, I can't do it. I won't. Uh, there's, there's no way I'd. I'd be living on the streets. <laughs> so let's uh, let's thank our Jeff. Do you remember our uh, our sponsors? Do you think you could do it? Let's see. Let's see how good uh, you are. Okay, let me let me scroll up here and I can do it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Go for it. What do you got? I want to thank uh, Luxurious Leopards, Lilith Leo, Leo Lovables, the Reptile Report Marketplace, Holly's Homebred Reptiles, Happy Gecko St- Situation, Top Notch Leopard Geckos, and Fire and Ice Geckos for this lovely show. This wonderful show, and, and don't forget Thor Gecko, Morgan. He's he's on a small hiatus. He's out just relaxing and doing other things, so we want to thank him for this also, because without him we wouldn't be talking. Yep, we we have to thank Mr. Morgan. He's the man. Mr. Morgan. Yeah. Epic and legendary Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where's, where's where's our uh where's our music for that? I don't know. Do we have music? You don't have the music button? <laughs> <laughs> you need well, music we, button. we do yeah. have a music button, but we don't have any music to it because we haven't come up with any music yet cuz we can't have music on the show without it you know, with all the other fun stuff that goes along with the music. Oh, sounds complicated. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to go into it. So, anyways, thank you, Jeff, again, as always, sir. It was a pleasure to have you on with uh, Mike. We can go over go over some of the care. Yeah, definitely. I'm gonna. Um, I'll probably go on go look at frogs all the rest of the evening night yeah probably <laughs> probably me too all right well you have a wonderful evening jeff and i will be talking to you soon 
All right. Thank you, sir. No, thank you, sir. Have a great evening. You too. Bye. (laughs) Thanks. Bye.